How did you get Lewis Hamilton to come on Gumball? Yeah, so... We're at Gumball, come on. It's Gumball time. I am Maximilian Cooper, founder of Gumball 3000. What is the best thing about owning the biggest rally company in the world? Oh, I think the best thing has just been... What has been the toughest moment? When things go bad, you do question everything you're doing. People hated it at the time. Probably that light bulb moment that, you know... Max, you yes. are the founder of Gumball, arguably one of the most known automotive brands in the world. What is the best thing about owning the biggest rally company in the world? Wow, that's quite an introduction. Thank you. Um, what is the best thing? I think for me, I think the best thing has just been that my sort of almost uh, entire, well, actually my entire sort of working life has been doing something that I absolutely love. And so, you know, I, 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 every day it's not really work still. There's a lot of pressures and there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you learn a lot in doing this for sort of three decades almost, you know, but uh, it's exciting. And, and, um, and it's allowed me to kind of just travel the world and meet some amazing people and, and really just sort of uh, live the, the best life that I can. But that doesn't happen overnight. This year, you're celebrating 25 years of Gumball. And what I want to understand is how you've got to where you have done today, because that doesn't just happen. That starts from something. So if you could pick one moment from your earliest years that mm -hmm. you think was the moment that set you on this trajectory, what would it be? Uh, there's definitely a, a, a couple of moments that were sort of tipping points in our, in our awareness that kind of... Uh, got us the notoriety and the sort of uh, early reputation that we achieved but I, but in you as a person in, in, in your a, earliest years that set you on the path to owning this brand and the things that you've done you know before i started gumball in in the lead up to gumball i think i had this incredible decade of the 1990s that i was uh uh it sounds like i'm a jack of all trades but you know i did a bit of i did several things really exciting things quite quite uh you know, to a different, to a good level. I was sponsored a skateboard. I went around the world doing that. I, I got asked to model. I ended up modeling for sort of, you know, six, seven years that pay me some amazing money. And with that money, I learned to race cars. And so, you know, the modeling world, the skate world, the, the, um, the car racing world, sort of, that was my life for the 1990s. I've also got something on table tennis and football, did yes. I say? Yeah, well, I can't throw too much in. And then, you know, <laughs> table tennis and football were things more at school. That that was more that sort of level that I, I, I played both of those to uh, to high standard and, um, you know, national level and that sort of stuff. So, um, and I love those. I love all sport. Sport and music are really kind of what make me tick, really. And, and obviously cars and the culture of that world sort of embraced in that really but i think by the end of the 90s my life by that point i'm sort of uh you know mid-20s i have had this incredible decade and i've got friends that are now celebrities and and sort of you know some friends that are really wealthy that were race team owners of, of teams that i was involved with racing or they were sponsors or, or they uh you know in the fashion world i got to know some of the biggest fashion designers as as friends and so I just, the, the, the moment for me that sort of kicked all this off was I wanted to create something that all these friends of mine could enjoy. And some of them weren't into cars, but they were into parties. So it was kind of like, you know, there was this one, how can I bring this collective of sort of call it to, to sort of a, uh, for ease of explanation, let's say skaters, the car world and the fashion world. How can I bring that all together? And so I thought, you know, the common denominator that they all sort of love is they love parties. So I thought I'm going to throw this incredible party, get them all together and, and sort of, you know, everyone has a great time. And it's probably the foundation for me, you know, with a vision at that time to create a brand that they could all enjoy. And when I say brand, it was probably more aimed at sort of a clothing brand. I'd studied fashion, a place called St. Martin's. That was my kind of, you know, the world that I've been sort of absorbed in in, in, in that early, early 90s sort of period. But it was all about creating a brand that all these guys could enjoy. So how can I create that? What's the, you know, I've got all these amazing contacts. So essentially I thought, you know what, just put them in the same room for a party is going to be a, a great night, but it's not going to kind of do more than that really. So I thought the other thing is no one's actually really seen me sort of create anything at that point as towards a brand. So I thought, you know, if I invite these people on a, on an adventure, on a road trip, 
and they all enjoy it, that's really they're part of something I've created then at that point. So the first rally came about simply as a way of me just putting these friends of mine in the same room together uh, for seven days sort of thing, you know, as, as a as a as a road trip around Europe and a party every night and and just sort of as a you know create something that was really an incredible adventure and an experience and and just knowing or hoping that this group of my friends would connect and really you know what I what I saw firsthand was that they all bonded because this week of this rally was wasn't an easy week it wasn't a, when I say an easy week it was a it was a huge endurance um you know people hated it at the time and by the end of it they sort of had bonded and so it's sort of you know I realized that this sort of sharing a journey together with people much like let's say you climb a mountain with six straight you know several strangers by the end of that journey you'll probably bond for life with them because you've sort of endured something together that sort of has connected you and and um that this first rally very much did that and and it was really the sort of um you know, the second I did that realization that this was my route to kind of creating that brand that everybody can enjoy in my diverse circle of friends, you know, whether they're, you know, like the skaters or the fashion world sort of thing, you know, they they can all sort of feel part of this. And so, you know, that was the, I, I mean, I did that first rally and it was probably that light bulb moment that, you know, I'm going to do this rally again. And this is my fashion show each year it's my way to kind of reinvent the brand to kind of represent something every year we take a different route every year on the rally so it sort of is a is a constant kind of creative process in many ways seven in ten of you aren't subscribed to this podcast you'd be doing me a massive favor if you could just hit that subscribe button so please tap or click and hit that subscribe button if you want to keep seeing these episodes so after that first year of gumball what i find quite interesting there is you've got a group of friends and you've managed to put them all together on the same event i've become friends through doing the podcast network through lots of people that have been on the the podcast and i'm able to talk to them hang out with them be in youtube videos a lot if i ask them to take up seven days of their time throughout a 365 day year yeah that's quite a challenge to get those types of people in yeah. the same environment for a week especially as like the first time you're trying to do something did you manage to get everybody that you wanted to on your first event i actually uh surprisingly i think i did i um I'm sure some people uh, that I can't think of off the top of my head, I must have invited people that couldn't do it. But essentially, it did sort of achieve that kind of uh, eclectic kind of mix of people and cars and, you know, had an element of wacky races kind of feel about it that that was what I was sort of trying to put together, really. It, it really was as diverse as sort of, you know, supermodels to to um, to Chris Eubank in his in his truck. Um, Chris was a big boxing champion, you know, at that time and sort of, you know, an eccentric character that was was part of Gumball in the early stage. Um, and it had it had a bit of the the stereotypes in a way. It had our sort of, um, you know, like I said, very wacky races. It had our sort of, you know, Penelope pit stops and Dastardly and Muttleys and our shakes and princes and our skaters all, all melting, so, a melting pot of everyone. Let's get a sense of scale. How many cars, how many people was on your first event? So, really small, 55 cars. That's um, small then, is it? <laughs> well, yeah, in terms of... Well, you know what? It felt small more because there was no public around. It was just sort of us doing it. So, um, you know, there were no big public events. There were parties every night, but they were very kind of... Uh, they felt great at the time, but when I look back on what they really were, they weren't the scale that we sort of produce these days. But they had a really nice sort of... Um, I guess, personal feel about them. Um, you know, different artists that were participants on that rally would perform at the different hotels or clubs or whatever it might have been that night. And and it was all very, very organic. No one was booked to do it and everybody paid to enter it. And, you know, and the entry fee was really, um, you know, small for what they got that year. It was £3,000 per car to enter. It was 3,000 miles. It was Gumball 3,000. It was... You know, 3000 wasn't a calculated entry fee that cost out, budgeted what people were actually getting. It was more just for the the number of 3000 being this magical number to me. So, um, but why Gumball? Where did the name Gumball come from? Uh, it came about really because I'd spent the sort of, uh, let's say, the five or six years leading up to Gumball, sort of quite sort of uh, heavily involved in, in, in motorsport and, and the car world at that point and... 
Um, and the motoring events and the brands that I was sort of involved with that time at that time were, even though I'm, I'm sort of, you know, going to say that they were kind of cor very corporate and I, I didn't enjoy them too much. I loved, the, I loved racing, but my week, my diverse life at that time, let's say every given week, I was sort of spending social time more with my sort of skater and fashion industry friends and music friends and going to corporate events in the automotive world. And the auto automotive world was a bit kind of uh, corporate and boring compared to the those other worlds. And so I wanted something, when I was creating something within the automotive sort of sector, I wanted it to sound fun and non-corporate. And, you know, obviously I'd grown up watching, watching films in the 70s and 80s, like the Cannibal Run, um, the Gumball Rally in the States, which had the same meaning for the word Gumball and Cannibal, which was like something rolling from A to B. Um, so the word gumball for me sounded really fun, but I'd also he heard the reference that um, the artist Andy Warhol had used for chewing gum, uh, for gumball, you chew it up and spit it out. It's that sort of uh, analogy for sort of famous of five minutes. It's sort of, you know, and, and I like that kind of pop culture kind of meaning to the word gumball. And then I also started gumball in, uh, in 1999, where the whole world was talking about year 2000, Y2K, the whole world was going to collapse, you know, when the clocks changed from 1999 to year 2000. And so very much that was a, a, a prominent thing for, ever, for anyone that lived at that time that was sort of in business at that time. And, you know, computers were fairly fresh in, uh, in everyday life. And, and um, everybody thought the world was going to stand still at, the, you know, as the clocks changed to the year 2000. So I wanted to be sort of a brand of the future. So the word, the number 3000 came about as for the future. Um, but the word, the, the number 3000 also kind of has multiple meanings. Like after the Le Mans 24 hour race, people have raced 3000 miles. So I always thought, you know, that if you, you know, if you can race 3000 miles in 24 hours, then I'm going to spread it out over six days. It's going to be easy. And, but it's got this sort of magical kind of, uh, you know, history in the automotive world as this distance of, you know, what you can achieve in 24 hours, basically Daytona, Le Mans, the whole lot, you know, they're all that 3000 mile distance. Um, so Gumball 3000 was pop culture brand of the future, basically for me. And then how did that develop over the following years? Because within this 25 years of Gumball, yeah. you've taken cars into North Korea. You've had Lewis Hamilton join on the rally. You've done all these things. How did you develop that first rally into something that actually stuck and become part of car culture every year? I think, uh, you know, one of the kind of assets that I had from the, the starting of this was that this eclectic bunch of friends were all quite successful already at that point in whatever careers they were in. If they were, you know, fashion industry, or they were some of the most famous designers or mo supermodels or the, the musicians I'd met were in famous bands or, or uh, um, you know. the Jamiroquai, uh, yeah, Kylie Minogue. Yeah, exactly. Or, or uh, you know, film stars or whoever it was on it. My co-driver was Jason Priestley, who was in a show called Beverly Hills 90210 at the time. And, and um, they were all pretty successful people. And I, I sort of, without really intending to, sort of realized that on that first rally, they, the, the famous ones, they sort of had their publicists promote that they were driving on this. So, you know, without really uh, having the resources or anything like that to have our own PR company or, or um, you know, anyone working on the promotion or anything to do with this i was just putting on this road trip road trip for friends by the time it happened we ended up doing deals with multiple tv networks and and some of the celebrities brought you know got got uh, magazine deals and we got you know so by september of that year the rally was in april by september of that year because of lead times of, of, of print publications back then we ended up getting sort of gq esquire fhm and maxim maxim all run you know, cover stories and huge features on it. And, and um, you know, they were the biggest sort of entities of their day. And Pre-social media. Pre-social media. Was big. Yeah, it was, that was what was big. You know, everyone was trying to get a cover of GQ or FHM. You know, their circulation was in the millions every month. And, you know, they'd come to us wanting to cover it or, or celebrities on the rally, they wanted to cover it through. Um, Kylie Minogue on the first rally, Danny Minogue on the first rally brought, brought a whole entourage of sort of media covering her participation. Um, it, it just sort of got this organic kind of interest in the sort of the, the news, entertainment news sort of world at that time. 
And the you know even the car world picked up on it. The first rally, Autosport entered a team into it. You know, and and um, and journalists to cover it, photographer and uh, and journalists. So we had a. I, I even want to look back at that first rally. I don't even think we've had a uh, an entry grid as probably. I mean, in twenty five years, we must have done. But that first rally, let's say, is up there as being one of the most interesting and amazing car grids that we ever had as well. You know, McLaren F one LM. Gordon Murray's Rocket, uh, Venturi LM, uh, AMG Mercedes CLK GTR, um, low drag E Type original gets harder I mean, to top every year. What's that? Must get harder to top yeah, it every year. I mean, you think of those sort of cars. I mean, just having the McLaren F1 LM on the rally alone is a pretty special car. And at the time, it was you know sort of fairly new still. So it was just someone's new new road car that was on the rally really. And and um, you know, cars of that ilk and and the the Mercedes CLK GTR. I mean, these are cars that are selling in the in the multiple millions these days. But we happen to just have them on the rally as everyday supercars of the day, sort of thing. You know, so um, and it, we also had like a, a toy company founder from New York entered a, an ambulance stuffed with toy toys and whatever and stuff and and like i said chris eubank drove this sort of peterbilt truck um it was just a really incredible mix that you don't really see at too many car events so clearly the personality characteristic that's shining through for me since you were younger that's probably 50 percent of why all this has succeeded is the fact that you're so creative yeah it's definitely a, a more creative take on you know, whatever we do, it's looked at with a different kind of uh, vision to uh, to certainly to what the automotive world was back then completely. And it was this combining this sort of, you know, pop culture worlds that, that I enjoy. But as you said before, you were friends with a lot of the guys that came on the initial rallies. You had the network. It was a way of getting those people together yeah. in the same room. But quite often mixing business with pleasure when you start charging can actually yeah. be a really challenging thing sure. is that one of the things that would have put you under the most pressure as an initial early founder of a business like that sort of asking your friends for say to put their trust in you spend money and come on your business and your event absolutely yeah it, it really would have been but i think i was uh you know too um just on my own mission to kind of I mean, for a start, I never, whilst I had this vision to kind of create a, 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 what I want, you know, keep describing as a sort of a, a lifestyle brand, let's say. I had that vision back then. I didn't have any business plan or any structure or any sort of financial know-how and, you know, mapping out, a, you know, a, a, putting a budget together for this first event was sort of almost like I didn't have one, I, you know, in the sense that I wanted to create something so special and sort of you know unique and a bit magical at times that I, I just went all out to kind of achieve that without having any money thinking that you know what I'll um if I put something on good enough then I'll be able to attract the money I'll be able to get some sponsors or I'll be able to kind of pay for it like that and you know the, the fact that I was charging uh people to participate in it was actually more from the fact that I had been sort of part of that world whilst you know i i wouldn't sort of known myself as a you know any sort of uh no sort of fame at that point but even being a sort of model i'd get things thrown at me for free you know any fancy events you'd get in, you know invited to fashion brands that all give you clothes for free um I, I sort of you know i had some friends that were sort of were big celebrities at the time that that would get everything just sort of given to them almost and i sort of felt that um these big characters and personages that i knew that i was inviting on this i sort of felt like if it was free they might not show up and it's just like another freebie sort of thing so you know the fact that they had to pay to participate was almost me it was just me sort of uh you know a having some money towards covering the cost of putting it on but it was really B, it was about confirming them as being part of this, getting their buy-in, essentially. Nobody wants to lose any money or pay three grand and not show up. So it didn't matter how wealthy they were. I kind of felt like if they'd paid to enter, they're going to do it. And it was also very much me explaining that first one about, you know, we're going to book hotels around, you know, Europe and it'll be these amazing venues and, 
you know, there was a Formula One race on that rally as well. So it was, it wasn't me just sort of asking for some money, sort of frivolously sort of thing. It was sort of very much at that time, you know, you'll be getting these locations and F1 and, and, you know, F1, you know, spectacle and all that sort of stuff. So it, it wasn't so hard to get the money out of people to, to take part. I think, you know, looking back on it, um, and as you reference sort of asking this level of, uh, of people that seem to probably travel nonstop and have incredibly busy lives, I would actually say that, um, you know, back in 1999, the world wasn't so fast paced and taking a week out of someone's schedule wasn't the same as it is now. Um, you know, talking to, uh, friends of ours now that, are, you know, not even, uh, I wouldn't even say the traditional words of sort of music and, and and film and sport but talking to sort of the influencers and and that sort of community everyone is so busy everyone's day is booked out sort of thing you know and you know we talk to people now about doing the rally and they're like well i could do like two days of it and i'm like well no you can't do two days of it because you won't experience it but it's really funny how uh the pace of life has increased do you feel like the pace of your life has increased as it well has, yeah and when i look back on those early years of gumball it's really um it's almost hard to explain to my, you know, collect my, my office now, let's say to, to all the, uh, production staff and everyone that, you know, you got to remember those first days of Gumball, there were, there were no digital cameras. They didn't come in until 2004. So there were no photos, everything that every visual bit of content that we took was on, you know, old school video cameras and, and, and tape and photographs were on negatives and slides and you know when we when we were booking venues hotels and whatever we were writing letters and we were waiting for letters to come back in the post and you know <laughs> life is just totally different you know emails weren't used even back then very by by very many people so you know it was very much about uh having the time to meet people in person uh, pretty much everyone that entered on that rally, I would have I would have had a lunch with, a dinner with, or something in the lead up to it to kind of talk to them about it and what we were planning. I don't think I'd have the time to do that now. You know, everything the pace of everything is just completely different. I think we referenced the other day in the office about you know those early years, the first sort of uh, uh, five, six, seven years of Gumball. The fax machines were going like crazy, and some people in the office were like, "What's a fax machine?" You know, and that was the only way that you'd put out information to to media. You know, it was a was an old school dial up fax machine. Um, life is just different. Having a brand that's existed twenty five years, it's an interesting kind of, you know, we've seen such interesting changes in tech during that time, and and the pace of life and um, travel, everything. You know, what we put on as a as a as a spectacle for the week of the rally. I'm trying to make it groundbreaking still, but back then it really was because travel wasn't so easy for everyone. So what is what was for you the most significant year of the Gumball Rally? I mean, I would have to say that 2001 was the, the first um, spike in our awareness in a, in a mainstream way. Um, that that really was a kind of a an early tipping point to take it from being uh you know sort of out of out of working you know three or four people working on it from my sort of one bedroom flat in london to kind of signing deals that were putting several million pounds into our account that changed were game changing were sort of completely life changing really um and that was really on the back of um the 2001 rally was was the third rally. I definitely say that uh, already by that time, the first two years had really gone a fair way to put us on the map. We we both of the the first two rallies we'd got uh, features in in the wish list of every publication that we would have wanted to be in. You know the ones that I mentioned like GQ and FHM and uh, you know auto car and 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 whatever it would have been the biggest car magazines and and the biggest lifestyle magazines of the time um we'd also by that point we'd had a channel four show on the second gumball um 
in the UK, we'd started to gain some awareness already by that by that point. And the third rally was was the one that started in 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 London and drove to to Saint Petersburg in in Russia, and then back through Scandinavia to to cross the finish line back in the UK. Um, it was televised on the BBC, on BBC One as a as an hour long special. Um, presented by a, a host called Ruby Wax that uh, was a mainstream TV presenter at the time, American uh, TV personality that that uh, you know lives in the UK, and and um, at that time she was doing these kind of she had a, a sort of a weekly show on which was like Ruby does something, it was like Ruby goes to the Playboy Mansion, Ruby does you know goes to the Olympics, whatever it might have been. And one of them was Ruby Does the Gumball Rally. And um, it was mainstream, BBC One, big promoted show. Um, couldn't have got a better kind of, you know, broadcast deal at that time in the UK. And then that same year, we did a, a TV deal with MTV in the US. And it was televised as a Jackass hour-long special. And the Jackass guys were were friends of mine already before I started Gumball. So we actually kind of we knew, knew each other through uh, through skateboarding. Uh, been friends for for quite some time. The uh, the guys behind Jackass as well, the 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 director of it and so on. We know each other through through action sports worlds. Um, so they started Jackass kind of, I'm guessing sort of uh, around 2000. It came out of a magazine called Big Brother. It was a skateboard magazine that they end up sort of uh, um, releasing old school vhs videos of, of skaters you know and a couple of the guys that worked for big brother magazine one being johnny knoxville in particular that that wrote for the magazine was not a very good skateboarder so he'd get in the videos in another way and one of the ones one of the, one of the things he did was uh shot himself uh with a magnum like this sort of putting a few copies of playboy under his t-shirt and and uh, they put that in the video and and that was kind of equivalent to kind of you know went viral sort of thing um, don't quite know how it went viral without any social media, but that kind of, you know, the, you, you get the idea. It got talked about a lot. And um, that for them led to um, the Jackass guys uh, essentially getting a deal with MTV. Um, and they came to England to shoot most of their first series because MTV wouldn't wouldn't insure them to uh, to do the crazy stunts that they were doing in the US. So the same... The sort of the second year of Gumball, I had a bunch of these sort of, you know, friends of mine making this TV show quite often staying with us in London and and just sort of, you know, we're on our same journey together. They're building this incredible sort of fun show in the States. I'm building Gumball. And so by the time this sort of third rally came about, we were like, you know what, let's why don't you guys all come on Gumball and, and shoot, you know, shoot it for a special sort of thing. So so they did. And um, it came out in the summer of. Uh, 2021 and it was the highest watch show of the jackass series and it was the highest watch show of M on mtv of that year so it was the tipping point for us really you know it put us into a it put gumball as a into a being a you know exposure by you know mtv was really important at the time a major world brand yeah mtv was a was a huge deal back then and um you know, particularly Jackass guys were at their peak of their sort of fame, and and the two two of us just collided at the right moment. I think. But it, it's funny. See, I will definitely get myself on Gumball one day when I have the slight more means to be able yeah. to do so. Um, not quite there yet. However, I remember growing up as a kid and watching Shmi's channel and seeing his McLaren 650s okay. go across the start line. That was the first time I'd ever seen Gumball. Right. And then the videos of the cars in the street in London. It's funny now, now I've got to the point where I've got cars that would be able to go yeah. on Gumball. Yeah. But I'm not quite at the level to be able to actually go on the event yet. But that is my first memory. And yeah. when I do sit on the start line at some yeah, point yeah. waiting yeah, to go, yeah. that's where I would have come in at. Yeah. And it's funny, those influencers, did you think that they would actually have when you started, when social media was created and it got involved with Gumball, did you actually think it would have such prevalence than what it has actually had and the effect it's had on the rally? No, I, I honestly didn't at the start. I think, uh, again, we've sort of gone through those waves of sort of, uh, you know, generations really kind of experiencing Gumball. And, and I think um, when Tim... Shmi sort of sort of 
I met him for a few years before he did Gumball. I think when he was still at school, he would he would come along to the start line and wave the cars off because one of his cousins drove in Gumball in the first few years and, and is a close friend of mine. Um, so that's how I sort of met him first and then heard that he was doing this sort of, you know, channel on YouTube. And, and um, we'd actually had a sponsorship deal from YouTube prior to Tim starting his channel even. Um, so that I was kind of like, we'd, we'd try to put out YouTube Live, Gumball, Gumball Live on YouTube in the in 2008, um, which must be similar time to when he was starting off I'm, in, not, yeah. I'm not quite sure I'm rough rough years um but I, I have to say in those first few years of sort of you know um him and other youtubers of the day let's say I I didn't think that they would have such kind of clout that they have gone on to have um they've become a voice of their generation basically in the same way that uh, a decade before we would have had you know the Jamiroquais and Jackass guys and, and those sort of guys being a voice of their generation, basically. So, um, and in more recent years, yeah, I mean, it was a 2018 rally for me. I know it's far more recent, but um, still, still sort of uh, six years ago. So time flies. But that year's rally, when we had all of FaZe Clan and Clout Gang on the rally, that was the first time that I saw that kind of level of fan. Um, hysteria for youtubers um they came on the rally london tokyo and we did pop up we did a collaboration with phase and released gumball phase clan clothing and did a pop-up store in london and milan and los angeles and tokyo and you know we had sort of three four hour lines around the block to kind of for kids to come in and buy a bit of merchandise and those guys on the rally was was sort of um it was interesting for me because that same year we had other sort of celebrities that I, I'd say are kind of uh, almost, you know, I'd say legends in the world of, of entertainment, like the likes of David Hasselhoff and Usher um, and DJs, big DJs like Afrojack and those guys. But they sort of almost became at that point sort of your old old school sort of celebrities and phase became this new school that was just like, you know, again, teenagers going crazy for which which I hadn't seen for some time. When you've got that mix, though, of David Hasselhoff, potentially Lewis Hamilton, yeah. YouTubers, young young males or normally in, yeah. that, in that realm, yeah. and you put all of those people together in one space, and yeah. how many cars would that have been that year? 120. 120 cars. There's got to be hundreds of people involved in those cars, and you put those testosterone fueled, ready-to-go males in one place. Can you keep all of the people happy all of the time or is your goal on the rally to keep some of the people happy most of the, the time? The participants on the rally. Mm. Uh, my goal on the rally is to kind of host and and, and people are sharing. They're, they're very much, I sort of try and keep it the same emphasis that it was right in the start whereby I'm sort of inviting people. So it's kind of like you're coming on my my journey. It's not a corporate week. It's, uh, you know, you're paying to enter, but it's still kind of whatever we've planned goes kind of thing so i'm not trying to um you know handhold people's experiences through it i'm trying to create something that is going to be an emotional roller coaster of a week that i know is going to sort of uh you know break people at some point and and sort of but they'll get through it and and i'm sort of you know again you're dealing with um uh, fortunately i don't really one nice thing is that the Gumball's a real leveler that week, that the hierarchies of those sort of celebrity names, they don't really, um, whilst they stand out for the for the fans, obviously, like I mentioned, but as a participant, like you could, even those guys I've just referenced, like Usher and Hasselhoff didn't know who FaZe Clan were. They'd never heard of them, you know? So they're kind of looking at those guys where they're screaming fans, thinking, why, what do they do? You know, who are they sort of thing? So... In many ways, it's a bit of a bit of a level of all round, and the the week of the rally is such a kind of a sort of a, a, an ordeal of of an overload of of uh, of the senses in every way that people don't really care about what each other do. There's not that kind of high I'm so and so, you know, I run this company. What do you do? Kind of thing. People don't get a chance to do that. You know, they kind of are just on this journey together. And it's really only at the end of the rally or, or, or even, you know, weeks or months after it where quite often people find out what 
some of those people they've met on the rally actually do in their day lives sort of thing. And it's quite nice that the rally is just this sort of, you know, uh, really, um, you know, one experience that that sort of brings all these people together. So I, I don't I don't have to I don't struggle to look after anyone. Do you get applications from people coming across your desk that you decide not to go with because they think you they you you think they would cause trouble on that rally? Yeah. So again, let's let, if if I take you back to um, two thousand and one, up until that that third year's rally was still you know I increased the entry grid a little bit year on year. It was uh, fifty odd cars the first year. The second year was about eighty five cars. The third year was about one hundred and six cars, something like that, and. Um, that was really still a very organic um, approach to who drove on it. It was really people that I knew or friends of friends and, and, and so on. And then after that Jackass show, we went through a period of time where we were getting a thousand applications a month at least to, to take part. So, you know, it became a process within the office, which was growing at that time. Of, of managing the event to kind of be a bit more selective and and who should do it. And I think, you know, again, that sort of similar, um, you know, so the following year's rally, you know, we got all excited that uh, I think 2002, three, four, we had close to 200 cars in each of those rallies, which was the most that we could actually facilitate in terms of, you know, hotels and venues that could accommodate enough people sort of thing you know and and then i decided you know it was a bit too many and i didn't i wasn't really um the scale of production that we'd started to kind of produce on the event was by far greater than the entry fee re revenue so i kind of decided you know like let's let's bring it back let's kind of uh um the 120 cars that we've been every year since around 2006 is because it's about the right number that we can look after every time and um, so every year, there's obviously a, a huge portion of applications that don't make it through. You know, in fact, actually, when you really break it down, um, of the 120 cars every year, and these are these are sort of loose uh, percentages for you, but essentially, 50, 50 of the cars come from the alumni, and so the six and a half thousand people have taken part in Gumball now. So we're only looking for 50, 50 people from six and a half thousand that have done it in the past so you know not saying that everybody wants to do it every year that on it but it's almost a first come first serve with taking up those first sort of 50 slots the second 50 slots are, are really you know introducing new people to it and if you think that uh i'm only wanting 50 new teams to enter from the entire world and that breakdown then means that i literally we break it down we, we tr really try and curate it as much as possible so we sort of allocate five cars from the UK, five entries from the UK, five from North America, five from South America, five from, you know, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and so on, really. And that's how the grid is made up. So if you think I'm only offering five places to North America, I only need five teams to enter from the US and Canada. It becomes really quite easy to fill the grid, but it makes the process really a curation kind of process of, you know, who are those people? What do they do? You know, what are they going to bring to the table, essentially? You know, and and what car are they bringing? And it to just merely not not to analyze or assess them at all, but just so we're, we're creating something that's that's really uh, eclectic. So th those 120 cars on average that go on the grid every year, mm -hmm. drive across the world, get flown in planes, go wherever they want to go. Yeah. That has resulted in creating a business which I've seen is valued at over 300 million dollars yeah. yeah. as a brand. How much does it actually cost in 2024 to go on Gumball? Me and Bold Steve wanted to get in the Lamborghini. Yeah. And you said, you know what, Ben, there's the tick on your application. You can come yeah. with us. What would that cost me? So the entry fee is £80,000 per car now. So in dollar terms, $100,000 basically, which is more what it's priced at in, in globally. Um, and that covers everything for you for the what it is now. Sort of, I think this year is nine-day event. So nine day event that goes where this year starts this year in Saigon in the in, in Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, also called Saigon. And over the following week goes through five amazing countries in Southeast Asia. So it goes through from Vietnam through Cambodia, 
in Cambodia, through Thailand, through Thailand to Malaysia, and then crosses the finish line in Singapore at the Formula One race in Singapore. Um, and you also get VIP hospitality in Singapore at the F1 race and all of that as well. So, Does that cover car transportation? No, it doesn't. Not at all. Because people enter from all corners of the world and, you know, obviously even allocating, as I, as I mentioned, the sort of the way the grid is made up, then uh, wherever the route goes to, we allow for a, a quota of cars from each of those countries. So, for example, you know, three to five cars on this rally. Uh, are from you know all of those countries I've just mentioned. But whilst they're um, actually on the rally, they don't need to be flown. It's just to get not there. this year. Some years we fly the cars mid rally, and if we do that, then of course that's included as as part of it. You know, and sometimes we've flown the cars twice mid rally. I mean, one year we started in London, drove to Belgrade, flew the cars from Belgrade to Phuket in Thailand, drove from Phuket to Bangkok in Bangkok. You know, after the party that night, the next day flew all the cars again. Landed in Utah in, in the US and then drove to Las Vegas and crossed the finish line on, on Rodeo Drive in LA. And that was, again, that weekend to weekend, all of that, three continents, uh, two flights mid-rally of all 120 cars on uh, 40 cars on, on a plane, three cargo planes, and then a passenger plane for, for sort of 300 plus people. Um, so it's quite a, you know, an adventure. And if you want a gumball event to go to, you can actually afford to go to, then you need to be going to the Saturday the 15th of June event at Shelsley Walsh. Gumball are teaming up with Piston Hill Climb to give you an event at Shelsley Walsh the day before Father's Day. There'll be over 150 cars present at the day, all firing up the hill. And people such as JWW, Shmi150, Matt Armstrong, DDE and more. I've left the link to be able to book it in the description of this video. And if you use the code R2SUCCESS, which is also in the description of this video, then you can get 15% off your tickets. I'll be there, so hopefully look forward to seeing you. So big question, one yeah. that everybody actually in the amazing Gumball HQ behind wanted me to ask the okay. actual question to. How did you get Lewis Hamilton to come on Gumball? Or did Lewis Hamilton want to come on Gumball? Yeah, Lewis wanted to come on Gumball. So we uh, we met socially. Um, we actually met at a football match, first of all. And uh, we were both guests of a, um, uh, of a mutual friend, uh, of, a, of a sponsor of Gumball, actually, at the time, who was also a sponsor of Lewis. So, so we were... Uh, put together for a, an event and and, uh, and and got to know each other and the course, course then the following year we sort of uh, we just hung out you know occasionally and he'd invite me and my wife to uh, to different races and and um, you know had a just developed a friendship really and so he's like you know how, how can I do gumball sort of thing so amazingly he squeezed in doing gumball between between f1 races you know and and um which I thought was great. And was that one of your favorite memories from Gumball? What would you say your best memory of Gumball is for you? Oh, I think I like, um, you know, what I've learned over the years that um, by having this incredible sort of, uh, let's say, powerful network of participants and, you know, the ingredients of what the the event is with sort of basically cars and music and and, and, and you know, as I mentioned, the sort of, bringing cultures together that I've really enjoyed the fact that through um, the language of cars and the car community throughout the world and the music language of music and the music fan, you know, music fans of, of, of the artists that are on the rally that through those two, two worlds, you can open up doors and break down barriers. And, and I've taken the rally to, to places that you wouldn't think were even possible, but through, you know, a global passion for those sort of two worlds that it's enabled me to to sort of you know take the rally to North Korea or how the hell do you do that? So do you just pick up the phone and message Kim? Like how do, how does that work? Yeah, I mean you know it's a long long story really, but um, essentially yes, through the language of of sort of cars and music and sport, um, developed a relationship with with the government there and and sort of we became a a totally different proposition to anything that they've experienced in recent years, which is, of course, always a political one. And we were we were coming to it through a, a, the equation of just, you know, exploring the world as a as a one world adventure. But then our knowledge of North Korea is that North Korea doesn't necessarily like to show the people the West. And yeah. uh, and and you if you've got the likes of a days at David Hasselhoff on the rally, which I think encompasses all things American. Yeah. And you've got the likes of yourself and Lewis on rallies, yeah. which encompasses all yeah. things British. Yeah. 
and there's a lot of color and there's a lot of girls and there's yeah. a lot of everything on yeah. Gumball. Yeah. I'm very surprised those two things went together. Yeah, well I think again it's that that language of um you know sport, music, film, it, it breaks barriers down. You know, I often wonder why um well, I don't wonder really because I, I sort of see it in action. But, you know, politicians don't do a very good job of being very you know, diplomatic or using kind of, uh, um, let's say, shared passions to open up communication. You know, you, you can go all around the world. And if you're into cars and, and into that car community, you could actually bond with people and have a have a great conversation. And the sport does the same. You know, if you're into football, you can go around the world and have conversations with people. And it doesn't matter what race or religion or nationality or whatever they are. You get passionate about talking about, you know, a football match or a, or a hypercar that's just come out or something. All of that other all those other issues that that sort of separate the world for multiple reasons disappear and you can just have this kind of you know uh, a really kind of you know human to human kind of conversation on on things that that we enjoy together and unfortunately politics almost go the other way quite often or politicians often often uh, you know go, don't use that enough really you know so what we're saying is you've got the gumball foundation you've got gumball what we need is a, a one-off invite only gumball politician wow. race I that th might actually <laughs> sort out the world i mean we loosely kind of call the uh over the years we've sort of occasionally um i mean amazing we've actually worked with the likes of the un and and, and put on sort of uh you know events through the foundation that are sort of trying to use our voice in in in, in that way for for good um, but, you know, I, quite often we use the, the term, the sort of United Nations, a gumball, um, which is really this kind of, you know, incredible network of all race and religion and, and nationalities that all kind of, you know, get together and, 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 uh, and have a great friendship together. But as you mentioned, all of this is like fantastic. Getting the cars into North Korea, doing all these moments, there's been plenty of them which have been fantastic mm -hmm. but if i wind it right back to the beginning when you said you know had this all this creativity but not necessarily lots of business prowess yeah. i was very much learning that yeah, on yeah, the job yeah. as well yeah there has been crashes on gumball over the years yeah. there has been things that's going wrong what has been the toughest moment that has almost made you as well in that moment on the rally in the last 25 years and is there any point that you thought i just can't fucking get through this yeah, I've had a few meltdowns over the years for sure, and and um, you know, yes, touch touch some wood. We don't have too many accidents, but uh, it's sort of the nature of uh, uh, of doing road trips. Unfortunately, that uh, you know, too many cars together, and 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 different countries, and you know, new roads and whatever. Then we've had cars fall off the road, and 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 it's something we try and avoid, obviously. And and um, I think every year, year on year, I sort of uh, um event production sort of increases and now we've for the last decade we've, we've worked with uh you know multiple governments to make this a spectacle for them so but what so, has so, been yeah, the so hardest going, moment so, well i think for me probably in the early days of it when there has been an accident and and sort of you know seeing that sort of firsthand um you know it just sort of makes you question whether you're doing the right thing whether you know the the premise that i kind of launched everything on was to create something really fun and and uh, a great you know experience and adventure and something that everyone would enjoy and so you know when an accident happens and everyone questions whether you're actually kind of putting something on that is that is fun and and you know do people like it and and um so you know when when things go bad you do question everything that you're doing and and um you know thankfully we've we sort of had a enough support over the years on the on the the bad moments that that we've got through them so has there ever been a year where you've not enjoyed doing Gumball? Do you in properly enjoy going on the rallies? Because there must be so much pressure winding on the fact that you want to make sure everybody has a good time. And when you're trying to be a people pleaser and make sure all the people are having a good time at once, it can be very challenging. I mean, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's been really kind of behind the scenes kind of, uh, you know, struggles going on. I mean, one year's rally, 2010, it was, uh, the route was London to New York and on, Day one, we were driving London to Amsterdam. Day two, Amsterdam to Copenhagen, which is driving through Germany. And and I had a, a legal battle with Germany um, to allow us to drive across Germany because they have certain rules and regulations that, mean that means that uh, 
cars that have numbers on or cars that have sponsors logos on would deem us to be an illegal road race and and so they declined any permits for for Gumball to cross Germany and so you know the week of that rally I had a court case in Germany that I had to attend against the government and you know and I lost that court case and and so suddenly you know here I am the week of the rally and you know at that point 2010 we've got TV deals and huge corporate sponsors and and you know a bunch of you know incredible people participating and you know yeah I'm sort of on the spot to kind of solve that issue within you know within a matter of hours before the rally is flag dropped in London and we're driving towards Germany you know so do you cope well under that pressure I, I do I think I, I've learned to kind of uh, I've always been pretty calm and um uh, I don't get flustered too easily um but obviously the, I've experienced so many kind of challenges over the years that I think I've learned you know even more how to handle sort of situations like that and, and sort of always always feel that there are solutions and there are solutions always so um you know I I, I don't um you know it's not something that I, I'm embarking on every rally to to have issues and have to overcome them but the sheer nature of what we do anyway of putting on a an event that uh, in the course of a week crosses multiple countries and sometimes multiple continents and is also 300 you know people to to manage and look after and now in each location when we're arriving into each city there may well be you know 5000 people there to 500000 people there so you know it's kind of it's a rolling festival that has every reason for things to kind of have issues thrown up every day that we just have to kind of deal with. Do you think that you still ever get those moments which you're like, I just can't believe this is happening? Like if you were sat next to yourself as a kid yeah. explaining what you were doing in a certain moment, I always like to think of it yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Would that kid lose his mind at the sheer scale of the coolness around it? Or yeah. do you think that where you'd already pre-Gumball been around so many different life experiences and people, do you think that ever takes the edge off a new experience? Um, I think partly the reason why we also kind of, you know, every rally is a it's completely different route is really to keep me completely absorbed and invested in kind of still treating it slightly, uh, you know, in, in, in a little way, a bit selfishly of a way for me to experience the world as well. So we're not really repeating too much twice, you know, never done, never done the same route twice, you know, so it keeps me really kind of, you know, excited. Um, but I've definitely had moments on the rally where I've I've had those sort of goose goosebump moments myself. Where um, I think you know 2016 um, Dublin to Bucharest, and on the third day we drove into Regent Street, where we closed Regent Street, Oxford Circus, Piccadilly Circus, Regent Street, all closed with hospitality areas and fan zones. I and, came to and, that, yeah. You know, and it was Regent Street and it's like I'm from here, you know, and, and in London to drive into that street and to see the crowds and and to think, look up and see, a you know, that hundreds of uh, gumball flags down the street and thousands of people. That was like, wow, this is kind of like amazing that we pulled this off, you know, that it's grown to this level sort of thing. Do you ever worry that you're going to outgrow the world? And by that, I mean, if you're if you're Elon, you've sold to pretty much yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. there is across yeah, the world. Yeah. So you've got to go to Mars. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm not sure myself when you'll be around to see yeah, yeah, Gumball yeah. go into another planet. I'd love to to go to another planet with Gumball, but I, I, I you know. But so where where do you go if the brand's worth 300 million? You've got funding to do pretty much any concoction of creativity yeah. that pops up in your brain. Yeah. What? What and how do you do? You sit at home at night, yeah. maybe with a glass of red or something, and think, yeah. where are we going to go? Or does it just come to you in a moment? It really is a combination of things. That it is partly that me wanting to just explore and take it to new places, and and particularly places that I am, I'm not very well travelled in. So it's a new experience and adventure for me. Um, there's also an element of of um, you know with a commercial head on, uh, of taking it to places where. We we know sponsors want to take us, you know, want us to take it to. Uh, sometimes a combination of taking it to places where we know we've got a great fan base already, and equally interesting, taking it to a place where we know we don't have a fan base, so we'll build a new fan base there. But I I do, do genuinely kind of uh, 
we look at the map these days and and sort of plot different routes out and and a bit like you sort of your question um we're almost running out of world to kind of do it in new places there are some regions that we haven't done but maybe haven't done them because they're not safe enough to it if i throw a random one out to you have you done india before we haven't done india and we haven't really done south america so those those sort of two regions that uh that that uh do excite me to do it you know there's there's elements of infrastructure and and um you know that that we need to make sure that they have and and the safety issues really i, I have been there the thing is with india you'll be driving along and it's like whoa this road's road's, road's smoother than the uk what are they on about yeah. and then it just stops yeah. <laughs> it yeah, just yeah, yeah. it just runs out yeah, and yeah, something yeah. that you wouldn't be able to overcome yeah. just yeah. ends up coming up in front of you yeah. so yeah. you must take some pretty what we haven't covered yet is actually what planning goes into the rallies do you personally do the reckies for every single rally or is that something that now sits with the team i i make sure that i still do every every year i'll do a recce of that route so the rest of the production team are probably likely to be uh traveling to multiple cities every month um we also work on uh incredibly right now we used to sort of you know early years of the rally was sort of you know what should we do next year now we're sort of really mapping out between now and 2030 so you know the planning takes a lot more effort these days and, and integration with the cities because we're really trying to close down city centers and 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 make it a huge scale event where where you know the event eyeballs is a, yeah and, and where the event is sort of supported by the cities or countries you know we've we've um you know increasingly over the last sort of decade we're we're sponsored by ministries of tourism so we'll have ministries of tourism, different countries call us up and, and say, you know, how can you bring Gumball? So, you know, that's really exciting. So, And one of the mo most profound things that I think you've done with Gumball and building out the brand is every year the cars go on the grid. And aren't they ordered on the grid by the silent charity donation that, yeah, they, yeah. that they've made to the Gumball Foundation, correct? Yeah. Do you want yeah. to explain just what the Gumball Foundation is? Yeah, so... so um set up a, a, a charity a, a non-profit foundation back in uh, 2013 and really that came about because by that point you know we'd been going for over a decade then and I sort of you know at that point was a time for me where I sort of almost had a chance to reflect on the network that we'd built at that point and the the uh, you know incredible sort of fan base but also the you know the the voice that we had amongst that sort of fan base and automotive community and um, and wider community, the community of uh, of the fans of some of the celebrities that were on the rally. And I just thought, you know, we're in a position now where we're not on the same hustle just to kind of, you know, build a company and, and keep afloat. And, you know, we're in a position where we can sort of slightly, uh, um, you know, do some good with, with the network we've created and what, what, we're, what we're doing around the world. And also, you know, the, the, the level of... Um, of, of production that goes into things behind the scenes now we end up developing really amazing relationships with the different regions and cities and countries and 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 what i don't like or didn't like back then was you know i'd spend sort of two years working back and forwards with a you know the, all the different locations on whatever route was coming up and the rally would happen that'd be sort of that would end that relationship in a way because we've we've done it we've gone sort of thing so i sort of we had this sort of i had this idea to kind of um almost create sort of what we'd call uh, legacy programs that that we could sort of leave something behind in each country or that that we're going through on the rally and so the foundation came about to sort of implement that sort of mindset really and and use that voice and wealth of our of our community really so over the last decade the foundation celebrates its sort of 10th anniversary now um we've partnered with some fantastic organizations as well that are also uh charities that that um that that can actually build infrastructure of things. So work with Tony Hawk Foundation Skate Park Project to build skate parks around the world. Uh, Laureus Sport for Good, which is the world's largest sports charity to build you know, facilities, everything from football pitches, basketball courts to all kinds of you know, sports equipment. So what does a year on the rally raise? Um, I think that silent grid, as you sort of mentioned, as, as our um, foundation grid, as we call it. So that raises between sort of half a million and a million just on that which is quite good and then on the rally as well we have a uh one night is a sort of a foundation gala dinner 
so we have Christie's Auction House come and auction a few lots as well and and have an online auction too and that raises around a million too so uh you know each rally week itself can can raise a couple of million which is quite nice um and, and that really does go straight back into kind of these projects that we're doing so for the man that's done it all what is the one person or place or thing that you've not yet accomplished with gumball that you're determined to and that is a good question actually um yeah I, okay, I still have so many kind of ambitions in life that um that, that are across all these sort of sectors of, of of building this sort of this sort of brand but i i think in order to pinpoint on on what would i still like to do or where do i still like to go um you know i still got a long long way to go even though the brand is, is, is has got a great valuation and everything i've still got a long way to go to sort of um take it to where i would like it to be um as a global entity um we're in the process of of sort of uh, launching in the next next year flagship store in london and, and one in the middle east and um you know we're just sort of you know we've got another video game coming out it, it's you know i think when you're sort of a you know a, a, a entrepreneur and a, and a founder of of, of of a brand you sort of you don't sit back too often and just rest on what you've done it's always about what you're doing next so do you think gumball by the time you see it out will be valued at over a billion in the future as a brand is that what you're going for and if someone came along with a magic checkbook with that number on and slid it across the desk yeah. would you sail off into the sunset um also another good question actually i think it's something that sort of uh, enters my my um my mind quite frequently in the sense that uh since the early years of gumball partly because a percentage of the entry grid the participants in the rally are you know billionaires then the proposition gets pitched to me quite often if i want to sell it or um i've had probably probably every single year i have someone approach me that's done the rally to say i want to buy it or i want to invest heavily into it um, so I do look into it and, and uh, there probably would be a magic number that, that, uh, that I would, uh, con contemplate selling, but I wouldn't want to kind of sail off into the sunset. I'd rather kind of be, you know, as involved still as possible, because I think everything that I, I, I think, like I said, right at the start of this interview, the Gumball's allowed me to wake up every day and do things that I really enjoy. And so there's nothing that really I would want to walk away from that because it's what i love um i love creating i love being involved in in in, in constantly building a brand i think the uh the social side to gumball what it's created for me over the years is my entire social life and and you know it's just my life it's just everything that i sort of do there isn't a separate life to me other than you know trying to uh trying to have a some sort of separation with just family life you know wife and children and but everything that uh that i end up doing wherever we go whatever we do it's sort of somehow gumball related it seems like so maybe that will be the toughest moment looking at that check one day and deciding yeah. yes or no yeah max thank you for coming on road to success and sharing your story of how you've created one of the biggest automotive brands in the world that is a very effing cool thing to do. Thank so you. thank you very much. And if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button below and check out that Shelsley Walsh event with the link in the description. Thank you. Hopefully we'll catch up again in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you.